of the most exciting days we've had since being a church, as far as I'm concerned, because today we kick off our clinic. Yes! <laughs> Dr. Laura, could you just stand up one second? This is Dr. Laura Voss, for those of you who don't know. And now, now, Dr. Laura has had this vision of a free medical clinic for five years? Five years, maybe longer than that. Um, and it's just, she is such an amazing person uh, and an amazing person to work with. And it's because of her vision, it's because of her steadfastness, it's because of her resolve uh, that we are here today to be able to kick off this clinic that's going to, you know, provide so much help in our community. You know, we always talk about it's not about building uh, 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 the seats in this church, filling this up. It's about what can we do to be an example the face, the hands, the eyes, the mouth, the ears of Jesus Christ. And through this medical clinic, we're going to be able to do that. I'll share this little story when she came in this morning. And she was at, the, uh, at Hy-Vee. And she was just picking up a few things at Hy-Vee. I think, were you at the deli? She was at the deli. And there was a young lady that asked her, you know, I guess she asked her what was going on, what she was doing or whatever. And she goes, well, today, oh, she asked her about the Chiefs game. Now, Dr. Lard didn't even have a clue that there was a Chiefs game today. So... <laughs> We're going to have to have a conversation about that. But she asked her, she goes, are you getting prepared for the Chiefs game? And she goes, no. She goes, our church is opening up a free medical clinic today. And the lady started to well up. She started to tear up. And she told Dr. Laura, she goes, I don't have health care. And my husband don't have health care. I just started working in here at Hy-Vee. Um, and my husband, he doesn't have health care and Dr. Laura just said we have a free medical clinic. So Dr. Laura got her information, told her that the clinic opens at 1 o'clock. So prayerfully she'll show up and she'll get some medical treatment today. This can happen to every single one of us. It happens to every single one of us. We have an opportunity to share what's going on in this church. We have an opportunity to share something that will make a difference in a person's life. Not to have health care is a big, big, big deal. It's costly. You can't afford it, especially if you've got children. But it is such a need. And I think that this is going to just really transform the community that surrounds us. So as you're out talking, when you're at the grocery store, just let people know that this is free. I blasted Facebook with free clinic stuff. And I'm going to blast it some more because I'm excited. The other thing Dr. Laura shared with me today, which is another surprise, is that we're going to be able to provide mammogram screenings uh, for an entire week. They're going to be doing this and they'll come to our church and park in the parking lot for a day for eight hours and provide mammograms for any woman who wants to do it. Now, they're behind on schedule. So if anyone here needs a mammogram, if you know someone needs a mammogram, uh, we're going to put a date together, hopefully the 16th of December, uh, where they'll be up here all day long. 16th of December is the day before the clinic opens up again. Uh, so if you know anyone, if you or yourself uh, want to uh, get a mammogram, come up and get it done. This is what missional work is about. It's about helping people. So. I am thrilled to, to work with Dr. Laura. This is just, I, am, I, I feel like today is Christmas. I'm so excited, so excited. So I guess I need to move on. Um, the, <laughs> December 2nd, we have the gala, uh, a gala that's going to be happening at the Gamber Center. If you haven't purchased your ticket, this is one way you can support the clinic financially is, is buying a ticket, sharing with your friends for tickets. I just talked to... Uh, uh, Ms. Karen Taylor, who is organizing the gala, and we need volunteers. We need some ushers. Uh, we may need some, do we need waiters and waitresses? Or? Okay. Okay, yeah, we need people at, uh, at, the, at the front to sell tickets as people are coming in if they need to buy tickets, and we need, we need ushers. I mean, uh, this is one way you can get involved. The other way of getting involved with the clinic, I was sharing it this morning, is that you don't have to be a medical provider to be able to volunteer for the clinic. We have a host of things that we can do. We need hosts, we need runners, we need uh, volunteers for the children's ministry. Uh, we need all kinds of different 
things in addition to the medical professionals. So you can be involved. It doesn't take much. The next thing that we're going to talk about is, I guess there's a ladies' night out. You guys having a ladies' night out? It's ladies' night, and I'm feeling... Anyway, so if you haven't signed up for the ladies' night, I think back at, uh, at the booth back here, you can sign up and get yourself a ticket. Uh, where are you guys meeting at? We're going to meet at Ted's. It's a Mexican restaurant here in Lee Summit that's really delicious. At 6 o'clock, December 4th. I'm going to let these ladies have their night because that's really important. So ladies night and then uh, December, I believe it's the week, uh, is it December 2nd that we're going to do the Christmas decorations? It's, it's the 3rd, December 3rd. We're going to do Christmas decorations. So if you like to put up Christmas trees and, and help out with some lights or whatever, we could use your help. Let's make this a festive place for when people walk in. And they can, they can feel Christmassy. Festive and Christmassy. Festive and Christmassy. Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's my word. All right. Huh? All right, all right. Okay. <laughs> all right, guys, let's go to God. Father God, we thank you so much for this time, Lord. It's just a, it's just a remarkable day. Uh, every time that we can just... Uh, Thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. It's, 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 a, it's so humbling, uh, and it's so rewarding and so refreshing. So, Lord, we, we thank you so much for the clinic and the volunteers that are coming. And, Lord, we ask that you send people that need help and, and that the word gets out throughout our community. So, so at some point, there's a lot of people that just need help. We want to be busy. We want to be able to find ways that we open this clinic more often uh, than once a month, Lord. So we put this in your hands. We thank you for that. Father God, as we're here today, we ask that you open up your, our, our, our hearts and our minds to your message um, and that we're able to apply it as we uh, leave this place today, Lord. So we thank you. We thank you for all that you are. We ask that your will be done. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So last week, we were privileged uh, to have uh, Phyllis and Rachel come up and bring a message, and they talked about you know, the community, right? They talked about uh, uh, taking care of the least of those, right? We're going to get back into our sermon series this week about Job. Now, Job, I'm going to kind of recap a little bit, and then we're going to talk about, because Job today, he has a problem. He has a real problem. And I think this problem that Job has is a problem that we all encounter in our life. So I really want you to think about what that means. So let's talk about it. So, you know, the Bible describes Job as being this righteous person, this man of God, this, this, this honest God. And, and God even spoke on his behalf. And when Satan was going around and he came up to, before God and, and God said, hey, have you considered this man? Have you considered him? This man is, he's righteous. And Satan was like, well, he's only righteous because you give him everything. You know, he's a spoiled brat. He's only going to do what you want him to do because you're giving him everything he wants. So God gave uh, Satan permission to do some things in Job's life that causes a lot of grief. And we talked about what he lost. He lost all of his, all of his possessions. He lost his land. He lost all of his children. Uh, he's in a moment of real grief right now. His wife, we talked about the last time, his wife finally said, hey, man, why don't you just curse God and die? Because of the misery that she saw Job in. The misery she must have been feeling. And so, you know, I, I want us to, as we, as we go in to talk about what Job's problem is, I want you to, to, to identify a problem in your life. I want you to identify some things that have gone on in your life. So, so when, I, when I do it, when I officiate a wedding, one of the things that I do is I admonish the people in the, uh, in, in the, in the audience. And I tell them that when a, a, a marriage is hard and when two people are married, they're not going to always get along. And there's going to be some trials and, and tribulations in that relationship. And we all have a tendency to go seek help. 
from non-professionals, from people who are called our friends. And it's our job, if you are in the audience, is to keep them together, not do things to separate them. So we all have friends, we all have these people we confide in, right? Job is no different. Job is going through mo the most horrific time of his life. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've had a few of those times. I've had a few of those times where I was, <laughs> there's a saying, I was so low, I can sit on a dollar and swing my feet. I was so low. I didn't know what tomorrow was coming or what it was, or what it was bringing. And I just wanted it to stop. And this is where we pick Job up, all right? We're going to read chapter 3. Don't put it up there yet. We're going to read chapter 3 in the book of Job because this is that time where Job is kind of feeling sorry for himself. But I want to, I want to kind of set that up before we read chapter 3. So Job, is pers his persistent suffering affects his mind and his body. Though in great pain and believing death imminent, Job is going in between faith and doubt. So his situation's got him at one moment, man, he's got so much faith in God. I know God's going to take care of me. I know God's going to. And then the very next moment, he's like, woe is me. And you can only imagine if all your children were taken away. You know, we, we, this, this, this rings home a little bit because a couple of weeks ago, a, a, a guy walked into a church in Texas and killed a whole lot of people, and the news has reported that an entire family was killed. An entire family. Imagine the grief that this man is going through. He didn't care about the possessions, but his family's gone. Kids, grandkids, all gone. Having observed the persistent sur uh, suffering in, in, in hospitals. I go to these hospitals, I see these people suffering, and, and you know, we have a person right now in the hospital who's gonna have colon surgery. I mean, just to see these things happen, it, 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 it's, it's mind boggling how we get through these things. I see people every single day waver between faith and doubt, and I have to be transparent and honest with you, there are times in my life where I waver between faith and doubt. When it gets so hard on us, when, when that pressure gets so hard on you and then things are coming at you left and right, one after the other, you look up and, and you say, why God? Man, I can't take anymore. So I start to doubt a little bit. And right now, Job is in doubt. He was so strong, even for his wife, when the, when the kids were wiped away. I can only imagine, even when he, when he tore his robe and he started to cry out, he also had to comfort his wife. But in chapter 3, Job seems like a different person from the first two chapters. His great faith returns from time to time, but now Job his body wasting away, his mind racked by pain and loss, expresses doubt and confusion. And most disturbing, Job and his boys, his friends, because there's three friends that are going to come into the picture here, all believe that calamities and tragedies were judgments of God because of sin. Now, the Bible is very clear that Job didn't sin. Job was a, a righteous man before God. And I want to pick it up in chapter 3 because this is a prayer of desperation. This Job is talking, and he's literally praying. And I, I can identify with this prayer. I can identify with these words because I've been there before. When the pain gets so, so strong and so present that you can't breathe. And then you start to wonder why. Why am I here? 
And this is where we pick it up with Job. Chapter 3 says, After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, Let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said a man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. Let night, I mean that night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up the le uh, Levi. I got it. Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none, nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the door of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth, come out from the womb and expire? Why did the knees receive me, or why the breasts that I should nurse? For then I would have lain down and been quiet. I have slept, I would have slept, then would have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves, or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not hidden, a stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? There the wicked cease from trembling, and the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease, at ease together. They hear not the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slave is free from his master. Why is light given to him who is in misery, and life to the bitter in soul, who long for death? but it comes not, and dig for it more than, more than for hidden treasures, who, re, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave? Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For my sighing comes instead of my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but troubles come. Here is a man who is at his last string. He, he just, he wants it to end. He wants his misery to end. And just like Job, who is feeling sorry for himself to the point that he doesn't want to live, that he questions why he's even here. Why did you let me live only to suffer like this? I don't know about you guys, but I've been there a few times. Oh my goodness. Now I could never say something so poorly, you know, so such with, with, with uh, poetry like that. I can't do that. But I can tell you what I did do. I can tell you how I did handle it. I got on my knees and I just cried out. And I cried out and I said, why, 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 why? And then, just like Job, I called some people. So Job is sitting here. Just imagine this for a second. Job is sitting here. He's at his last moment. He's pouring out his heart to God. Why am I even alive? And then there's a, there's a knock on the door. His boys, three of them, they show up. Joe, we heard everything that has happened. Now, 
I want, there's, there's, there's three things that these guys did right before they just tear everything up. I want you to think about your inner circle. I want you to think about the people you put trust in. I want you to think about the advice that they give you. I want you to think about what you share with them. It matters. It matters in your life. It really does matter. And it, it doesn't matter how close they are. Can anyone in here tell me what these three guys did right at the very beginning of their encounter with Job? Anybody? Huh? They came. They came? Yeah. Anything else? They mourned. They mourned? Wow, this is a good crowd. Listen here. They did three things right. First, they came to him when he was suffering. Second, they empathized with him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. This was their custom. And third, they spent time with him. Verse 13 states, they were with him for seven days before they offered any advice. So for seven days, they stayed with this man. And for those seven days, I can imagine that this guy's, his misery was just getting deeper and deeper, but he had someone in there to comfort him. It's something about when you go to the hospital and you see someone in the hospital and, and you go to visit them and the, and, the, and, the, and the joy that comes across their face because they're laying in that bed by themselves and there's someone familiar, someone they care about comes in walking through that door and just kind of lifts them up a little bit. This is exactly what happened. These guys knock on the door. I want to be here with my friend. I don't want him to go through this by himself. And you know what, Joe? We're going to stay here as long as we need to stay here because we love you. We care for you. We empathize for you. We cannot understand what's going on with you. But I love you. And I want to be there. That's great. Wouldn't we all like to have friends like that? Wouldn't we? And we all have that friend. You know, like if you have a group of friends, there's always one that's a little bit more outspoken. You know, so for the seven days, everybody's sitting there and quiet and just kind of dealing with everything. Put this in your head. And you always have that one friend that just starts it up. This guy, for Job, his name was Eliphaz. He wanted to speak first. So here's, here's what happened. At first, Eliphaz appeals to Job's own example of admonishing and strengthening the weak. Having reminded Job of his fear of God and of his integrity, he gets to the point, right? He looks at Job and he tells Job, you reap what you sow. Whoever perished being innocent, he asked. Or where, where were the upright destroyed? Eliphaz's, Eliphaz is referencing the universal sinfulness of a man. Can man be poured before his maker? I mean, pure before his maker? Why God even charges his angels with error? How much more? those who dwell in the houses of clay. Eliphaz now reminds Job that affliction does not come from the dust. In short, your affliction is not happenstance. It comes from sin. So let's, let's just go back for a second. We know the beginning of the story. We know the beginning of the story that the God has stepped in on Job's behalf and he even told said, go test him because this man is the real deal. He has integrity that's incredible. He has a, a, a faith that's remarkable and immovable. And friends knock on the door. Hey, I want to love you, man. I just want to be here with you. I love you. And then starts to shred him. You have no integrity, Job. You're suffering because you've sinned. This is what he's telling him. And then he finally, he finally caused Job to repent. But, but as for me, I would seek God. Job, if it were me, I'd be asking God for forgiveness. 
Now that's some real pressure. Think about this for a second. Let's, let's, let's put this, this picture in our head. We've got this man who's dealing with some tremendous suffering. And there's a, there's a word that's called that men don't really like the, this word. We don't like, this, the, we don't like the word. But this is exactly what's ha- happening. I think Job was a little what? Vulnerable. He was a little vulnerable. His feelings are all out there right now. He has nothing to hide anymore. He is dealing with this in a raw state. Very, 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 very vulnerable. What happens when you get yourself into a situation and that heat is on you and that pressure's on you? You become what? You become vulnerable. And then you call your friends up. So the advice that they give you becomes really what? Very important. Oftentimes, we start to take that advice because of our vulnerable state. I love it. This guy is so, dude, you did wrong. Just admit it. I mean, this kind of sounds like his wife, too. Hey, just curse God and die. I mean, this guy is in a no-win situation. He says, as for me, I would seek God. He assures Job that if he repented, God would bring relief and redeem, redeem him from all his troubles so that even nature would be at peace with him. For your covenant will be with the stones of the field. Job, repent. Repent, Job. And God's going to make it all better. That seems to be pressure too, right? In addition to Job's problems and Job's issues and Job trying to reconcile this in his head, his friends now come and they put a different kind of pressure on him. They're saying, you are guilty. They have already condemned him. You are guilty. The only reason you're suffering like this is because you are a sinner. You did something wrong. Man, friends like that, what you need, you don't need them, do you? But I love this. I love this about Job. And see, this is, this is the powerful thing. And I, I go back to, to the comment Erica made several weeks ago, is that it wasn't about Job having faith in God, but God had faith in Job. And here's where it comes in. Listen to this. But Job cannot deny his conscience. He knows that he has not done anything wrong before God. And that is, he knows it. And even though the pressure of the friend saying, man, just, just go ahead and repent. It's kind of like, you know, when someone said that, you, that they confessed to something that they did wrong and they didn't do it wrong because of all the pressure. But even in the midst of all that horror and all that agony and all that pain, he could not deny his conscience. This burns Job with yet another trial, a trial of false accusation and judgment. False accusation and judgment, church. False accusation and judgment is what is making people just run away from churches. False accusation and judgment. His best friends are accusing him of something he didn't do. His best friends have condemned him and have judged him. Job realizes his sinfulness. This is interesting. He even recognizes the rashness of his words. But he cannot understand what God is doing and why he is doing it to him. Guys, ever been in that position? As positions harder between Job and his friends, and as his friends continue to insist that God's ways against sinners are easily verifiable, Job's words become more rash. In weak moments, he questions God. 
How many of us question God? Especially in a weak moment. Why, God? Why? Why did you let those people die in Texas two weeks ago? Why did you let this woman die in a car accident? Why did you let this family be destroyed with a home invasion? Why am I suffering in my life? All valid questions. But listen to this. Job's words are only more evidence of guilt to his friends. <laughs> they go, your own iniquity teaches your mouth, declares Eliphaz, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth declares you guilty and not I. <laughs> he just took it right off of him. I'm not calling you guilty. It ain't me, man. I'm not the bad guy here. You're guilty. It's your own doing. I'm just sharing what I see. You guys ain't having friends like that? I'm just sharing what I see. Your own lips answer against you. As Job spoke in his weakened condition, his friend showed no compassion or understanding to their suffering friend. Now, we talked about when they knocked on the door, there was some compassion there because they saw Job is hurting, we need to go be with him. You know, you get that phone call, hey man, you know, we got to get to Corey because he's hurting right now, let's go. That's happened, a little intervention right there, you know, people come and, you know, so their intentions were right, their intentions were good. They continue to press for his confession and repentance. The frustration and anger between Job and his friends increase, but Job will not relent. These guys are going, dude, you're guilty. You're guilty. You're guilty. You know you're guilty. Just, just. And Job's like, I'm not. I'm not. And then oftentimes this enters our relationships, friends. The anger reaches a climax as friends take their argument to its logical conclusion. If Job is suffering for his sins and if he is suffering like no other man, then his sins or sins must be heinous. And if Job still refuses to confess, his friends will inform him of his friends based solely on his Deductions from Job's suffering, Eliphaz says, Job's endless sins, a taker of pledges from the poor. Now he's starting accusing. This is, this is why you're hurting. This is why God's doing you, because you are not a good man. You're taking things from the poor, a withholder of food and water from the dying, an oppressor of the widow and orphan. He drinks it up like water. He drinks up iniquity like water. Now... They are literally accusing him. There's two things, church. Watch your circle. Watch your influence of friends. A long time ago, I was, I was, I was uh, invited to this, this business, um, uh, uh, what do you call those things? Seminar. And it had... Uh, Tony Gonzalez, Colin Powell, um, uh, another general, and they were talking, and, and it, was a good, it was a good conference. But Tony Gonzalez came up, and when he was talking, it was interesting what he said. He said, you know, it's about my success is about my inner circle. He says, all my life, I've had an inner circle. And then when I reached my career, to the pinnacle of my career where I'm making a lot of money and a lot of different things. He goes, the only reason he was successful, the only reason he was as good as he was and he maintained who he was as an athlete on and off the field was because of his inner circle. Why? Because they were honest, transparent, and they 
told him the truth. And that brought about real success. Obviously, one of the greatest football players that ever lived because his inner circle was honest with him. His inner circle didn't let him get the big head. If you think about this, this is what these guys are doing. They're trying to be Job's inner circle, and they're trying to hold Job accountable. But there's something I want to read to you in this book at the end of the story. Because next week we're going to talk about Job's faith, and God's going to enter the picture. Okay? Because God doesn't need us to speak for him. He speaks for himself. But this is something that's really, really interesting, guys. And I really want you, if you haven't heard anything else today, hear this. Because this is real, real, is as real as it gets. So these friends, these holier-than-thou friends, these friends who understand why God's doing this to Job, God says something to these friends, and he says it to us. He says, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. In other words, I am angry with you because you misrepresented me. I am angry with you because you took me out of context. You took my words out of context. You misinterpreted who I am as God, and I am angry with you. So what, Pastor? What does that mean? What's that got to do with us? It has everything to do with us. See, sometimes, especially we as Christians, we get our little holy roller cloth on, and, you know, we want to we let people know that <clears throat> I'm saved, and, you know, I know Scripture, and, you know, I'm an authority on the Bible. So we start to take different things out of the Bible to put to our argument to make our point. This is what these guys were doing. Now, they didn't have a Bible then, but they knew who God was. They, they had a custom, just no different than ours. They had religion. They had all these different things back here. And so the things that they had learned, they took completely out of context, and they judged and condemned a man who was completely innocent. We do it every single day. We misinterpret God's word every single day. And when we misinterpret his word, what happens, church? Then we become judgmental. We condemn people. This is the problem with the church universal. It's because when people walk in the door, they feel like they're being judged and they're being condemned. And then us Bible thumpers, we sat back and we, and we, we just, hey, this is what the Bible says. It's not my words. Sound familiar? It's not my words. It's the Bible. The Bible tells us, guys, that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So what that means to me is that things that anger God then anger God now. So when we take God out of context, when we take God's words out of context, when we use God's words to condemn and judge one another, oh boy, that's not good. That simply isn't good. So what would these friends should have done? These friends should have kept their mouth shut. And they should have just loved on Job and said, hey, man, I don't know what's going on, but we're here for you. Whatever you need, let us be here for you. Let us help you take care, take care of your wife. Let us help you get back on your feet. But they got all in God's business. Church, we get in God's business all the time. And it's not right. It's hurting people. It's destroying their lives. When a person come into a church and they're hurting, they don't want to. They don't want to be thumped upside the head with the Bible and to justify our arrogance and our prejudices. They want to feel love. They want to feel accepted. It's very interesting. I went to this. 
I went to this, this suicide prevention thing a few weeks ago, and I'd never been to one. Um, and, you know, suicide affects our young people a lot. I mean, a lot of adults suffer from it, but, man, it affects our young people. And there were just some things that I just wasn't aware of. And, and, and they had some people that had experience uh, with, with the depression, and, you know, some of them had attempted uh, suicide. And thank God they're still here to tell their story because their story is powerful. Their story is that some of the times these people that they, they get in these situations and become depressed and they just need someone to love them right where they're at. Instead of loving them right where they're at, what do we do? We cast them out. We don't let them join the club. They just want to be accepted. They just want to know that someone cares. And here is the real sad part. A lot of these people come right into places like this, the church, who should be open the door with nothing but authentic love, and we do just like these guys do. We offer them in, and we pretend to love them, and then we start to judge their lifestyle. Yeah. We start to judge the way they look. We start to judge how they act. And I am telling you, just like what we just read about Job and his friends, that makes God angry. It makes him angry. Our job is not to judge, not to condemn, and not to tell people how to live. What we should be doing and what these guys started off doing is to show people how to live. How do I show you how to live, John? I love you, man. You know, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know how you got to that point, but I'm here for you. And it's genuine and it's authentic. You know, Russ, he asked me how I'm doing. I don't lie to Russ. I don't say I'm doing great, and I'm not. I'm honest with Russ. Man, I, I'm having a rough day today. There's something that Jesus Christ demonstrated that wipes away all this sin. It's interesting. I was talking to my uncle yesterday, who, by the way, is going to come and speak in December. And I'm really excited uh, for him to come and speak. Very knowledgeable about the word. But he and I were in a conversation yesterday, and we were talking about love. And we were talking about uh, 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 the rules and, and, and the Ten Commandments. And Jesus Christ says, I came to fulfill the law, not abolish the law. Now, he was the fulfillment of the law, but he demonstrated the law with four letters. And he changed the world with four letters. And when he was encountered with people who were terrible people, who were sinners and should have been condemned and living all kinds of different lifestyles, he used four words. He dem I mean, four letters. He demonstrated four letters. Love is the active ingredient to God. It is the active ingredient. If I love you, I can't condemn you. If I love you, I can't judge you. If I love you, I don't put myself above you. He fulfilled that law, and then he told us there's two great commandments. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And love yourself. I mean, love your neighbors as you love yourself. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I want those four letters. I need those four letters. I yearn for those four letters. 
I cry for those four letters. I'm motivated by those four letters. I feel joy by those four letters. I feel protected by those four letters. I feel energized by those four letters. That's what we should be demonstrating. If you are a friend to someone, understand that you represent God in a way that a lot of people just don't understand. And it is our responsibility to emulate Christ in the way that we fulfill the law with those four letters. Let's go